This week on the Roommates Podcast. The truth is that a lot of people are not looking for equality, but for revenge. Oh, yeah. And oh. This, is, this is the problem. Oh, my gosh. This, this is the real problem. That's why I brought him on the show, guys. <laughs> this the, <laughs> no, this, this is the real problem. This is amazing. Right? You see this with um, radical feminist, with certain radical feminist oh, groups. God, we're going to get into this. You, uh, it's all good, man. I'll take, I'll take, I'll take the bullets <laughs> gladly. Um, you see it with some, you know, kind of ra- radical pro-black to the point of anti-white groups, right? There's nothing wrong with being pro black or pro woman technically mm-hmm. the problem is if by pro black you mean anti <laughs> people who aren't black that's a problem if you say you're pro woman but that slips into misandry and yeah. you know opposing or disliking or hating men then that's a problem and that mm-hmm. that's that's what's happening is so people who are moderate and reasonable need to rein in <laughs> rein in the crazy people yeah right because it, it's like no that's going too far Okay, it shouldn't just be like, okay, the shoe's now on the other foot. So I'm going to do the same thing that maybe not even that person did, but that group of people historically did. Okay. Yo, and we're back. We are back. We are back. What's good, everybody? This is Hafiz, and I am in Atlanta, Georgia, really excited about this new up and coming roommate because, guys, You know what? As you travel the world, you meet a lot of amazing people. Some not as amazing (laughs) as others, but you do meet a lot of really amazing people. And then occasionally you meet people who have very similar backgrounds um, of you, but they're from a totally different continent. (laughs) And the things that you've learned and the, the ideas that you've gained in life, they've also learned these things. They also believe a lot of the very similar ideas. And this new roommate is somebody who, man, I really found a huge connection with hearing him talk, hearing him share, hearing him engage in the world. And I'm really excited to bring him on to the show to have a lot of fun (laughs) as well as a lot of intellectual um, conversations. And guys, please welcome to the show the one and only Zuby. What's up, man? What up, man? Thank you for having me. What's the full name? Okay, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> you can call me Zubi. <laughs> so, Nigerian, shout out to Nigeria. Yeah, man. Ibo, you know. Ibo tried, shout out Francis. My, <laughs> one of my best friends, Francis, is Ibo as well. So. Okay, cool. I think everybody has a best friend that's Ibo. <laughs> or they should if they don't. So, Zubi, I know who you are. So, for the people who don't know who you are, can you give, them, give us a bit of an elevator pitch synopsis? No problem. So, my name is Zubi. I'm an independent rapper. Um, based in the UK and born in the UK. I grew up in the Middle East, and my family background, as you've said, is originally from Nigeria. I'm also a creative entrepreneur. I run my own podcast every week called Real Talk with Zuby, where I have fascinating conversations with interesting guests, as you do. Um, I also am the author of the book Strong Advice, Zuby's Guide to Fitness for Everybody. I also do a little bit of public speaking and working on some other stuff here and there. So overall, best known as a rapper and a creative entrepreneur, I guess. I like it. I like it. So Zuby has been somebody who is funny because I'm very picky when it comes to what I put in my ears. Mm. As as weird as it sounds having a podcast, I don't really listen to a lot of people talk. (laughs) I'm very picky. So it's like it's really challenging at times for me because just so many ideas are so bad, (laughs) in Mm. my opinion. And... I remember I saw a tweet by you. We'll talk about that tweet later. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's make them like you first before they, <laughs> before they grow to hate you. <laughs> but I saw a tweet by you, and that's when I kind of was put on, uh, you were put on my radar. And then afterwards, I um, was starting to see videos of you pop up, and you know, I saw a couple of clips. I thought, okay, this guy's kind of cool. And then a bunch of people were reaching out like, yo, you got to get this dude on the show. So I'm really excited about bringing you on the show because I'm really curious to... Um, some of the ideas that you have, and I'm really curious to just how similar I feel like our background has allowed us to become. Mm. And so one of the questions I have for you is, as a musician, you're constantly making music based upon the worldview that you're founded upon, Mm. for the most part. So 
in regards to your unique worldview, which we're going to get into as time progresses, what led you to believing and having the ideas that you currently have today? Well, um, I think the way almost anybody would answer that question would be somewhat similar. I guess it's a combination of nature and nurture. I've got my own specific personality type that I've always had since a kid, and then my own experiences, my parents, my family, the different countries I've grown up in. So I was born in the UK. I grew up primarily in Saudi Arabia. Um, my family background is from Nigeria. When I was in Saudi Arabia, I went to an American school for about eight years, which is why I don't really sound that obviously British. Not from London. No, no, no it's, it's, it's not obvious. Some people, some people can hear little, little bits of it, yeah, but yeah. Um, in the UK, even most people think I'm American. Oh, wow. So I've had that background. I've traveled to over 30 different countries, performed in eight of them, um, and I've really built my own path. I mean, I studied at Oxford. I graduated 2007 now. I worked in the corporate world for a couple of years. Then in 2011, I took a big leap and decided, you know what, I'm going to go and pursue my, my music full time. So I've kind of just been on this journey that I've been leading myself on, not something anybody told me to do or necessarily even suggested that I do. But um, I, I feel like I have a, a calling and I've been given a particular brain, a particular mind, a particular skill set that over time I've come to understand how unique it is in that regard. It's, it's a, I get asked that question a lot, you know, how do you, sometimes people even ask like, how do you think the way you think? And I'm kind of like, man, I don't, yeah. uh, I don't know. And I didn't know that it was anything that special until relatively recently when I've been going on some of these big podcasts and interviews and things like that. And people are like, man, you've got a really unique take on things. And you know, I always kind of assume that a lot of the stuff, I mean, I still think that a lot of the stuff I believe and a lot of the stuff that I say and a lot of the stuff I put out there is somewhat common sense. Yeah. But, <laughs> <laughs> but like, we, we're certainly living in a time and a place where it is actually pretty uncommon. That, yeah. That's how it seems. So it took a long time for me to realize, oh, actually, what I'm doing and what I'm thinking and what I'm saying here is, is unique and pe people value it. People want to hear it. So... As I learned that, I started just putting it out there more. Anyone mm -hmm. who knows me personally, anyone who I've spoken to in private would be like, oh, yeah, Zuby's, Zuby's always been like that. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? But yeah, yeah. I just started putting it out there more in public and seeing that people like it, people respond to it. People feel that a lot of the stuff that I say and do is is necessary. You know, Even being here in Atlanta for the, for the past five days, I've been at this hip-hop conference. And firstly, it's been interesting. So many people who recognize me there, recognize me from seeing me on the Joe Rogan podcast or the Candace Owens show or the Ben Shapiro show or the Rubin Report. And so that was interesting for one. But then secondly, the amount of people who came up to me and were like, man, like what you do is necessary. Like what you're saying is really important and stuff. So I'm like, okay, cool. If even if not to me, it doesn't always seem that special or profound if that's what it's doing for other people, if it's helping to embolden and inspire and motivate and, you know, help other people in any way, then that's incredibly important to me. That's why I became a musician in the first place. I wanted to use my voice for positive change, to have a positive impact and influence on people. That's why I've never rapped about a lot of the negative stuff that a lot of people... That, Firstly, that's not my life. That's not my background. So I'm not mm -hmm. going to pretend I, I grew up in the hood and I was gangbanging yeah, and stuff yeah, like yeah, that because yeah. that's totally fake. But then also it's like there, there's so much music and content out there with, with negative messaging. So why would I want to add to that? Why, why don't I use that same ability, use that same voice, but do it in a way that is positive to people and they can benefit from it in some way? No, that's good, man. I, a lot of things as you were talking just stood out to me. Um, and I'm trying to think about which direction do I want to take it. So let's 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 go here, because do I want to start there? Yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> I'm trying to think if I want to start in this direction or not. But I think this is a good direction to start in. So, um, so for the people who don't really know too much of your background, you put out a series of tweets, and you know, kind of poking fun at the status quo and the current conversations in society, which a lot of people believe are leaning towards a specific direction. Mm -hmm. And as much as we claim diversity and how much we love it, we actually like people who look different from us, but, but believe the same thing. Mm -hmm. 
and we talk about the importance of the diversity of thought, but most people are not really having diverse um, conversations, mm -hmm. um, diverse friends politically, mm -hmm. re um, religious-wise, ideologically. And so you, and that's kind of was your, so to speak, rise to fame was, was kind of, you know, poking satire at the political status quo and the, you know, the ideological idiosyncrasies <laughs> of today. Mm. And one thing that I noticed is for a lot of people who supported you and brought you on their show and was interested in talking to you, from my opinion, I could be wrong, a lot of these individuals were white. Mm -hmm. And I didn't see as much enthusiasm, interest, support, uh, curiosity from your story from those in the black community. Mm. So my question to you is why do you think that's so? I think some of it is simply numbers and demographics. Yeah. You know, I'm from the UK, I'm in the US now, you know, both white, white majority countries. Yeah. You know, the majority of people who are running these big podcasts or doing these shows or on the news or whatever, you know, it's it's primarily, you know, there's a there's a range of people of different Skin tones on there, but you know, if you're in a, if I'm living in the UK, I'm not going to be shocked or surprised that, yeah, you know, it's 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 like that. So so some of it is some of it is simply numbers and demographics. Um, beyond that, though, you know, I do think that there are certain elements of what I'm saying and what I do that certainly step out of line with certainly in the U.S the kind of, I mean, you, you use the term the black community. That's not a term I really use nor like. That's good. Because I don't think that it's a real thing. I think, you know, when people say community, to me, community means something pretty specific. It means, you know, people in a certain local geographic mm -hmm. location or maybe who have a, a, a real shared common mm -hmm. interest yeah, yeah. or something. So, That's yeah, you, you can have a, you know, maybe you can have a, Hip hop community of Atlanta, yeah. like to me, that's a community. Mm -hmm. You can have a, you know, a, um, a Pokemon community yeah, yeah, on, yeah, yeah. on Reddit or yeah. something like that. That's a community. You can have a local uh, bingo players community. But when people just use the term black community, I'm kind of like, you know, there's a billion black people in the yeah. world, mm -hmm. and most of them are not in America, right? You know, <laughs> the vast majority of them are are in Africa, and you know, sp spread out all over the world. So oftentimes, when people use the term like, and that's a little bit of an I think it's a bit of an American thing of to course. when people say black people or even black community to automatically think black Americans. That's really good. And I'm like, that's not 90, 90 percent of the black people in the world are not American. Right. You've got every country in Africa, all of even which in Africa, like they're totally disparate. Right. Yeah. And a lot of those groups are fighting amongst each other all the yeah, time, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, no, so no, 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 there's no, no, not no. really like this sort of shared black experience in, in the global sense. And as someone who's grown up in different places in the world and encountered that, that's something I can see kind of as an outsider that, hmm, that's a little bit, that's a little bit different. Um, someone was asking me sort of, I met, yesterday I met a guy um, actually at the conference, um, a fellow musician who had seen me on the Candace Owens show, in fact, and was, yeah. you know, really, really loved what I was doing. And it was interesting because he was asking me, you know, what's the difference between being, you know, maybe someone who's more conservative or right leaning and black in the UK versus in the US. And I was saying, man, I think I think it's tough for, you know, certainly black Republicans yeah. um, or, you know, black conservative leaning people in the US because there's more of a there, there's more of a group think here. And I can understand that with the given the history of the country. But somewhere like the UK, that's less that's far less of a thing there's there's less of those pressures and expectations okay if you're in the uk and you're you're black or you're asian or you're you're whatever there's less of an expectation that you're going to fall a certain way politically or that you're going to vote for the labor party because you you know there's plenty of prominent black and non-white conservatives and stuff like that so so a, a good example would be in the, U in the U.S., you hear people say things like the black vote. Mm -hmm. You would never, ever, ever hear that in the U.K. There's no such thing as the black vote because that's not even a voting block. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? That's good. Like they're, they're, it's, it's not like in the U.S. it's something like, what, 92% of black Americans vote for the Democratic Party? Mm -hmm. Only 8% vote Republican. Like that's the, I've never seen 
I'm not aware of any anywhere in the world, anywhere else where there's such yeah. a hard skew amongst any sort of demographic of people in, in one way or the other. So given that's the current status quo and has been for a while, I can understand it being difficult for people to kind of step out of line of that. There's so many pressures for them not to and so much ridicule and so much name calling and all that kind of stuff just from people thinking for themselves and coming, coming to their own conclusion. With a lot of the stuff I do and my message, you know, my message isn't overtly political a mm -hmm. lot of the time. A lot of people view me through this political lens, but a lot of what I'm saying is just encouraging people to think for themselves. Yeah. I'm not telling, I'm not coming to America and telling people, you know, you, you, you got to vote Trump, you got to vote Republican. I'm just saying like, look, just come to your own, look at the facts, look at the, look at the evidence, look at the policies and come to your own conclusion. Don't just vote for a party because other people who look like you yeah. or may share some aspects of your background are all going in that one way. Cause that's not, that's not thinking, that's monolithic thinking, right? Yeah. That's not, that's not free thinking. Mm -hmm. So that's why, you know, that's why I was, I really liked the stuff that Kanye did last year, you know, when he came out and he was wearing the MAGA hat and everything. Cause I was like, look, it, the underlying message here isn't, yo, y'all need to go out and vote Trump and vote Republican. He said, look, you know, it's like what Candace Owens, she says, she said, black people don't have to be Democrats. And yeah. it's like, that's, yes, that's correct. Like that's a fact. Nobody has to, no, 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 no group of any people has to have like this total allegiance to any any party. That doesn't that doesn't make sense. So um, coming back, taking a step back. So coming at it from a, a sort of UK sort of outsider perspective, is that something that I've always kind of seen and questioned yeah. for a, a pretty long time? Like I've always been like, why why is it like why is it why is it like that in the states? Like why why is it so why is it so one way? Um, and yeah, I think that that's starting to, I think, I think in hope that that's, you know, kind of just starting to change. At least people have it willing to have conversations yeah. and to look at the other side and look at other perspectives. Look, if you come to the same, same conclusion, then that's, that's absolutely fine. Not everybody needs to change their minds, but at least to be able to have empathy and like diver actual diversity mm -hmm. and actual tolerance for varying viewpoints, not just trying to demonize people or call them really mean and sometimes genuinely racist names yeah. because they disagree with you on what may be the best policy for something or other. No, and that's really good. And that's kind of where I was trying to take you mm. um, because the first point that you brought up is the word black community. Yeah. So it's really funny how you broke it down because you initially started the conversation by saying that you don't believe there's such thing as a black community, mm. which to an extent, I agree with you, mm -hmm. because as you brought up that, unfortunately, what has happened is um, black Americans have created a monopoly on blackness, right? Mm -hmm. And so most of the world, and you're probably a world tra more of a world traveler than I do, you know, they look up to black Americans as a standard of blackness. And so what now has occurred is that black people all view themselves under a certain umbrella, not, sorry, black people in America, for the most part, view themselves under a certain umbrella in which you know is not necessarily the truth, right? Mm. Because you said black people are not a monolith. We're extremely diverse. Yeah. Well, most people don't understand that in Africa, you know, it's not about blackness. It's not even about a country. Sometimes it's even tribes. Tribal, yeah. You're Igbo. I'm Yoruba. In, in, in some parts of Nigeria, you can't marry an Igbo person yeah. if you're Yoruba. You can't um, even, you know, do business with a person from a different tribe. And they look just similar as you do. So from a Nigerian perspective, you understand the diversity of color mm. just besides, that's why even me, I don't use the word race. Because mm. race is the worst way to categorize people. Yeah. Because if you're like an Indian, there's Indian people who are black, mm. but their culture is so radically different than a person from Ethiopia mm -hmm. who may not be as black as them in regards to pigmentation. Mm. What about albino people? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's true, but it's, it's, it's yeah. true, right? You yeah. know? And so, so the, the, what I want to bring up is that but then you, but then you went, but then as you continued talking, then mm. you began to talk about the pull mm. and the pull for people to all feel like because I'm this color, mm. I must behave in this way. Mm -hmm. And so when I use the word black community, I'm really talking about this weird set of ideas in the stratosphere somewhere yeah. in the cloud where people feel as though because my color looks like this, I must think and behave mm -hmm. and act in this manner. Mm -hmm. I must accept these ideas. I must vote for these policies. I must uh, dislike these people. I must like these people. 
And I found that to be quite fascinating because what now goes on is people like you and people like Candace and also, in all honesty, people like myself, mm. we come into the world and we're like, I'm not like that. Yeah. I'm not this. I'm not that. I, I don't agree with that. I don't mm. agree. Whatever you, you guys are defining, whatever you guys are defining mm. as, as the typical black experience or black ideology, mm. that's not me. No. And, and, and for, for people to have that expectation yeah. is racist by definition. Exactly. To assume that somebody is going to think or behave or act a certain way, believe certain things purely based off of their skin color is by definition, racism, right? If someone is, a, I mean, to me, that's the most pervasive form of, of genuine racism that exists in the modern Western world. Mm. I, I think we live in the, the least racist place and time ever in history of course. globally. Some of people course. will want to argue with that, but you know, if you do, tell <laughs> me what, tell, tell, tell me what, <laughs> tell, yeah, tell me, tell me what decade you would have, you would prefer to live in, you yeah. know, honestly. So that's the most pervasive form of racism that I actually see, you know, that sort of expectation that, oh, I'm going to fall in line a certain way, or I must fall in line a certain way, and if I don't, I'm going to be called names, or I'm going to be demonized, or you're going to call me a coon or an Uncle Tom or any. I'm like, that's, that's legit, legitimate racism, right? Mm-hmm. If, you've, if someone is a... Uh, man, you know, sometimes I don't even like to use these terms, but you got to kind of meet people where they're at, right? If someone is, uh, you know, if, if it's a white person, people don't assume like maybe that's the, <laughs> I'm always I'm always ridiculing the this silly notion of white privilege I think it's a, a bunk concept yeah but if it exists I would say that white privilege is the ability to believe what you want and vote what, the way you want and whatever without facing ridicule yeah and criticism mm-hmm. right because if you're you know with with a black person if it's a black person's like oh you know what I kind of like Trump's policies I kind of like the Republican policies I'm going to vote Republican if they're open about that man, they will get demonized by, you know, people on the left side of the political spectrum in general, whether they're white, whether they're fellow black people, whether yeah. they're whatever. And lots of the vitriol will be worse from... The blacks. From, yeah, well, yeah. From, from fellow black people. Yeah. And that's the kind of matrix that I'm trying to expose mm-hmm. and also just shatter. Because exactly. that's, it's, it's totally ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, and people, and people come up with, with crazy ideas. And, you know... Um, and, and people make all kinds of weird assumptions and, you know, I, I'm just like, look, just don't assume anything. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's, that's all I come down to. If I meet somebody, I don't assume much about them purely based on, you know, certainly not based on their skin color or whatever. People's, people's three favorite categories now in the sort of intersectional thing are, you know, skin color, a.k.a. race. Uh, gender and sexuality. I don't know why it's those three. Yeah, yeah, I don't know yeah. why it's those three that were chosen. It could yeah. have been. It could have been height, yeah. hair color, yeah. and IQ. Mm-hmm. It could have been. You know what I mean? It, it's it's just like people just decided those three are the three things that people are gonna gonna focus on. Um, and based on those three categories, you know, like I'm not gonna assume much. You know, I mean, if 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 you're physically a man or you're physically a woman, okay, I'll I'll you know assume certain biological characteristics, right? Mm-hmm. But that's it in terms of the way people think, in terms of people's abilities, in terms of people's interests, it's totally foolish to make those assumptions, you know? Mm-hmm. And to do so is sexist, is homophobic, yeah. is, is 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 racist by, by by the definition, right? If I if I meet someone who happens to be, you know, a man man who happens to be attracted to to other men, I'm not gonna assume that, oh, okay, because of that, you must believe all these other things mm-hmm. like the, how that, that doesn't even, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And it would be quite bigoted for me to make all these assumptions or yeah. even assume, Oh, so, so you're obviously a Democrat, right? But that's what people do. That's what people are doing. Like people just assume like, okay, now if you're talking about the U S it's kind of just assumed like the democratic party kind of like owns black people, owns gay people, yeah. owns women. And it's like that to me is the, is the bigotry. You, yeah. know, you see what I mean? It's like, no, you like, you don't own anybody. Like people are free, people are individuals and people have, you know, as anyone who exists in the real world knows, like people have real diverse viewpoints, which may be informed by their background or their mm-hmm. experiences, but lot, everybody has different backgrounds and experiences, even if they may share one common trait. You can take two people who look, you can take two people who look totally different, mm-hmm. but actually their lives 
and their, their, what's going on upstairs in their brain and their experiences and their family structures, all those sort of things that may interpret how, you know, people, the way people go. You could take two people who are totally different, but actually they're kind of similar no. in, in a, a lot of ways, right? And then if they met each other, they'd probably have a lot of shared experiences and things they can talk about, you know, might get on and whatever. And then you can take two people who, you know, sort of physically, visually look really similar, but they're totally, totally, totally different. And yeah. I, th I feel like most people sort of inherently know this yeah. deep down, but with the way a lot of the things are kind of going in the last sort of five to eight years, people have kind of forgotten this and people are kind of going back to making these assumptions and stuff like that. No, and that's, that's the part that I really, really appreciate about what you're doing. And that's the part which I really wanted to jump into okay. is the ability to free individuals from that ideology or mm. from that prism. Um, because I really believe the ability for an individual to be, to go against the societal flow is challenging. Mm. It's, it's just reality. I just think we, 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 we ask people to do so and sometimes we have to be honest about our temperamental behaviors and how we grew up as kids mm -hmm. because most people are, for the most part, agreeable. And most people, not to use the word sheep, but most people, they function well by following rules and function well by doing what's normal. Mm -hmm. um, I think sometimes we look down upon people who are regular, everyday people, but I think that's a healthy way to live for, for well-being of a society. If mm -hmm. everybody is just so... Um, you know, different in regards to not having common values, mm -hmm. as you see in America. It's really hard to hold a society up. Yeah. But we won't get too deep into that today. But, yeah, yeah. but I really want to help give black Americans, because the uniqueness is to black Americans, um, the freedom and black individuals the freedom to be who you want to be mm. and to not be trapped by what society says, mm. which is why part of the show... Um, the diversity of the show is not is not paper. Mm -hmm. I'm not looking. At, okay, I got a black guy today. I mean, the white guy tomorrow. No, I like these people. You yeah. know, I like Ben Shapiro. Yeah. You know, but I also like Hasan Minhaj. Yeah. You know, I also like Dr. Eric Dyson. I also like um, Roland Martin. Like, I like people from my myriad of views. Sure. You know, I'm a huge Jordan Peterson fan, and so to me, it's the ability to give people the freedom. Um, but I've noticed that people don't have that freedom. Mm. And when people don't have that freedom, then they're forced to fit these caricatures of, of an ethnicity. Mm -hmm. So the word, like, what does it mean to be black mm -hmm. is something that I see um, a lot of people monopolize in the black community in America. And by black community, I mean people who are thought leaders and pivotal individuals yep. in, in, in the black American mm -hmm. um, social um, stratosphere. And these kinds of individuals will then use a tool of de-blacking you. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you know yeah, what I mean? yeah. I've been told and I'm not you, black. You know, in order to make By you people fall. people who've never even been to Africa. But yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> make you fall in love. And, 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 yeah, yeah. and, and, that's, and this is where our Nigerian pride is going to get in our way <laughs> real quick. Because you and I both know, it's like you, like, oh God, I don't want this to get us in trouble. <laughs> yeah, dude, I want to be respectful. That's okay. I, respectful. I get in trouble every day, man. But, that's good. You and I both know our names and our family legacies have been founded in Africa mm -hmm. from the beginning of time. Mm -hmm. Our identities was given to us via birth mm -hmm. from our parents, from our grandparents, great-grandparents, and so on. Mm -hmm. No person has the ability to rob you of your identity. Of course not. Of who, you're, who, you, who God made you to be. Of course not. No one has that power from you. No. But what has unfortunately happened is that for people who don't have that, mm -hmm. unfortunately due to the horrors of slavery, mm -hmm. it's very fragile, their identity. So it's very easy for someone to question it because they themselves don't know who they are. Sure. So when a lot of people in black America identities founded upon the color of their skin and their blackness, whatever that may be, mm -hmm. that is rooted upon societal approval for what is black. Because in all honesty, black 
The idea of being black is was created hundreds of years ago. Sure. So you and I, you can't take that from us. Mm. Like nobody can tell. Like it's just like you can't. Like I'm Hafiz Bahoku. You know what I mean? Like, what are you talking about? It's, it's Hafiz Omatayo Bahoku. Like you're not. Yeah. You're gonna tell me I'm not what? <laughs> like yeah. you. You have. I'm sorry. No offense. Your last name is like Washington. <laughs> like you're not. Your last name is Washington. You're not gonna tell me. You're not gonna rob me of my identity. And so, people like you and I, because mm. of our background and our family foundation, we're so firm on that. Mm. So nobody can question. Like it's 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 preposterous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For somebody to question that, but for other individuals, it's not as easy. Mm. And for other other individuals who are in America, there really are a very there's a lot of fear to go against the status quo. And I'm not just talking politically. I'm not talking about voting for Trump. I'm not talking about anything. I'm just saying yeah. going against whatever black being black is. Mm. So for individuals who are trapped in that unfortunate prison in their mind, what would you say are things to be able to do or what we can do to encourage them to not be limited by societal standards of what it means to be black? Wow. Well, I think, you, man, you've nailed a couple of things there because I believe the greatest fear amongst human beings in general is fear of judgment from other people. If you think of anything that things that people want, genuinely want to do or desire to do, but they don't do, whether that's starting a podcast, starting a YouTube channel, creating a business, um, whatever it is, the, the biggest fear is fear of judgment from other people. People think it's fear of failure. It's not. It's, it's well, it's linked, right? Mm -hmm. People only fear failure because they fear judgment from other people. Exactly. Man, what if I start a podcast or a YouTube channel and no one tunes this in, really no one, good. no one, no one listens? That's that's what people fear. So that is something that you know, depending on some people's personality types and their boldness and their assertiveness and their ability to catch flack and take criticism, um, it's going to be easier and harder for for different people. I'm I'm fortunate in the fact that I'm not someone who greatly cares <laughs> yeah i can you, tell you know i just don't really really care. i can take thousands of critical comments and tweets and mess like some of them very very hateful some of them very very aggressive i can see them and laugh mm -hmm, yeah. and i'll share them with my audience and be like <laughs> look at this crazy one yo check, <laughs> check this out guys yeah, yeah, you, yeah. you see what i mean and i've built that up over a long period i've been a musician since 2006 so i got used to early you know first time I put stuff out and you know when I saw people commenting like man this is kind of whack or oh this guy sucks or this guy should quit kind of hurt to begin with you know but over time you kind of build you know what a thick skin and then you mm -hmm. eventually build like a, an exoskeleton and then just body armor to the point where it's like look there is nothing that you can say to me that is going to I know who I am I'm so confident in who I am that there's nothing you can call me there's no name you can say whatever firstly I've heard it all before mm -hmm. And secondly, by calling me that, all you're doing is revealing something about yourself. Because if you call me something that I'm not, why, why would it bother me? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I'm not that thing. So, yeah. like, you just look silly. In fact, you're, you're kind of being an a-hole for, for calling me that thing. It's like calling Shaq a midget. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Why, why, why should he be offended? Yeah. Like, ah, Shaq, you're short. It's like... <laughs> you know, you, you, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Blah, 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 you know what I mean? So yeah. it's, it's just silly. So in terms of how to, how to help people kind of break through from that sort of, sort of mental prison, um, you know, I wish that, uh, you remember that comment that Kanye caught so much flack for last year where he said slavery was a choice, right? Yeah. I so wish he'd said mental slavery. Yeah. Uh, I'm like, I wish he just added that word. <laughs> Cause <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't know him personally. I yeah. think, I think that's what was intended but mm. by saying it the way he did he kind of gave people a gift to just yeah. run around and, and malign him with it i think that the deeper underlying thing i think was this idea of mental slavery i think it was just articulated very poorly mm -hmm. and in if, if that's what he meant then i was like i would i would agree with that because a lot of people it doesn't have to come down to a, a racial thing or a skin color thing but a lot of people are in mental prisons people have these um limiting beliefs that they hold, whether that's on just what they're capable of achieving in, in life, in career, in relationships, whatever it is, you know, work with any, if anyone works with any sort of coach, a big job of a coach is removing people's mental barriers and limitations that they've kind of put on themselves. So that's, that's a part of it. I think it's important to do what we're doing right now, which is encouraging conversation. 
encouraging people to have conversations, to listen to conversations. It's why I, I love these podcasts, speak to people of, of different views. And by expressing those, it shows people that the Overton window is bigger than they may think it is. They may think, okay, we can only discuss things within this line. So it's important for, it's why I love uh, what some of these big podcasters do. It's why, I lo- you know, people love what Joe Rogan does. People love what uh, Dave Rubin does. You know, people who are out there having these conversations because it, it widens the Overton window. It allows people to, you know, what comedians do is important. What rappers do is important. What musicians do is important. Because it's showing, look, you can, you can, you can kind of talk about anything and everything. Mm-hmm. And you, not everyone needs to, you know, political correctness is a real double-edged sword. If someone means political correctness just to mean like being polite and not being abrasive or be, being what, it's like, okay, cool, that's good. But when people use it to just narrow the range of possible acceptable viewpoints and that becomes very, very narrow, then that's a problem because people, like you said, no, people are afraid. You, you create this culture of fear where people kind of feel like they're held hostage And people may have ideas which are totally mainstream, which 70% of the population believes, Mm -hmm. but they're afraid to voice it because they're, they're just, the conversation has become so narrow and the people who are running it are, are the radicals, right? It's, it's easy for a tiny radical minority to cow, um, a less vocal majority. Mm -hmm. This happens all the time, happens all the time. It's what's been happening over the last few years and, a lot of people feel afraid and worried, even though they might literally be in the majority, but they're worried about, oh, that 10% of people who are kind of crazy and radical, they're gonna come after me. They're gonna send the mob after me. They're gonna try to cancel me. They're gonna try to insult me. They're gonna try to ruin my career. They're gonna try to dox me, whatever people it is, whatever it is that people are afraid of. So it's an understandable fear. But what I'm trying to encourage people to do is say, look, don't be, don't be bullied. Mm-hmm. Don't be a coward. Like, stand up. If you, if you believe in something, if you have a principle, then stand up to it. You know, St- stand up to it. Don't, don't let anybody bully you. I mean, it's a weird thing because so much of the over-political correctness and the overcorrection and the, the bullying and the intolerance and whatever, if we're being totally honest, a lot of it is coming from the left side of the political spectrum right now. And that's quite ironic because given if you go back even just a couple of decades – You know, a lot of the stuff I'm saying now could have been applicable to some of the groups that the left traditionally sort of champions, Mm -hmm. right? Whether you're talking about gay people or you're talking about ethnic minorities, you're talking about women and saying like, look, you've got the, you know, you use your free speech, use your ability to not be cowed, not be shut down, like talk, you know, express yourself and say, hey, you know, if someone is someone is gay, you know, they spent all this time saying, you look like. What is pride? Like this, you know, the, the, the pride movement. What, what, what does it represent? It says, look, you are, this is, this is who you are, what you are. Don't be, don't be ashamed of it. You can take pride of it. You can, you can come out of the closet. That's literally the, the term people say. Mm-hmm. So it's almost like there's been this strange inversion <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> where, where the, it's kind of it's just overcorrected. And now people who are now more like right-leaning or conservative, especially, or even libertarian, especially people who have, you know, normal nine to fives or who are employment and things like that. I get so many DMs and messages, people who are just like, man, like I'm not going to express any of those viewpoints or anything like that because I don't want the mob to come after me. And I'm like, but those are mainstream viewpoints mm. you hold. Like yeah. I'm not, I'm not talking about some radical fringe, yeah. crazy, hateful ideology or something, just some pretty, pretty basic standard things that a lot of people agree on and enact in their own life, but people are afraid to voice them. Have so, you read um, Animal Farm? Yes, I have. That's exactly what it is. Mm. So, if, sorry for cutting you off, but it just, I've been saying this privately and I just want to, never had an opportunity to show to talk about it. But I would challenge everybody, if you don't want to read the book, which is a very short read, mm. to watch the, the, the movie on YouTube, um, Animal Farm, George Orwell, 1984, if I'm not mistaken. And in the movie Animal Farm, it's a movie about, it starts off with, as everybody knows, a bunch of animals living on a farm who are being oppressed by a human. Mm. Humans taking advantage of them, not giving them rights, not giving them freedoms. So what the animals decide is, you know what, what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to go ahead and remove the human 
Let's kick him out of the farm. And once he's out of the farm, let's create a now utopian farm where everybody's equal and everybody's treated well and everybody's respected. So they kick out the human and then, you know, animal farm begins. What ends up happening is that they start making up with all these rules. And the first rule is that all animals are created equal. Mm -hmm. But then slowly but surely, the pigs led by, I forgot if it was Snowball, I'm pretty sure it was Snowball, but one of the pigs starts to now gain a little bit more authority. And then he starts to now begin to leverage all the other animals to now kind of work for him. Mm. And then he begins to leverage more and more political power. Mm -hmm. Sounds familiar. (laughs) And then eventually, because I want people to watch this, I'm going to fast forward to the end of the book. At the end of the book, the pigs are now walking on their two feet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the pigs at, change the rule from all animals are created equal to all animals are created equal, but some are more equal than others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what you end up seeing is that the one who was oppressed yeah. then gets the power mm-hmm. and does the oppressing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The power seat corrupts all who sit on it if your heart is not pure. So what people will do in the past is that they will say, oh, it was the white people who were evil. It was the Republicans who were evil. It was the cisgender males who Mm -hmm. were evil. But what they don't understand has nothing to do with their gender, their religious worldviews, nothing to do with their ethnicity. Mm -hmm. It had everything to do with that if your heart is not pure and you're in power, you're going to take advantage of those who are not in power. And so whether you're a male whether you're a female, whether you're gay, whether you're straight, whether you're Christian, Muslim, atheist, Buddhist, whatever it may be, you are corrupted and you will then abuse other people. Mm. So now what we see going on, in my opinion, in more left-leaning, um, amongst more left-leaning individuals, is now that they have the power, mm. now it's time to bully those yep. who yep. once bullied me. Yeah, I mean, a big problem is that, I agree, literally everything you've just said is super duper on point. It's something I've observed myself. And the truth is that a lot of people are not looking for equality, but for revenge. Oh, yeah. And oh. This, is, this is the problem. Oh, my gosh. This, this is the real problem. That's why I brought him on the show, guys. This the, <laughs> <laughs> no, this, this is the real problem. This is amazing. Right? You see this with um, radical feminist, with certain radical feminist oh, God, groups. We're going to get into this. You, uh, it's all good, man. I'll take, I'll take, I'll take the bullets <laughs> gladly. Um, you see it with some, you know, kind of ra- radical pro-black to the point of anti-white groups, right? There's nothing wrong with being pro-black or pro-woman, technically. Mm-hmm. The problem is, if by pro-black you mean anti-people <laughs> who aren't black, that's a problem. If you say you're pro-woman, but that slips into misandry and yeah. you know opposing or disliking or hating men, then that's a problem. And that, mm-hmm. that's, that's what's happening is, so people who are moderate and reasonable need to rein in <laughs> rein in the crazy people, yeah. right? Because it, it's like, no, that's going too far, okay? It shouldn't just be like, okay, the shoe's now on the other foot, so I'm going to do the same thing that maybe not even that person did, but that group of people historically did, okay? What There's, does that sound like to you if I, I'm now doing wrong to a group of people based upon, what for whatever reason, mm-hmm. simply based upon them being a certain color, mm-hmm. What does that sound like to it's you? It's racism. Oh, wow. Simple. Simple. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the same thing, you know? So <laughs> this is this is something I've, I've observed over the years. I mean, I think we reached a, I want to say like the golden age was almost like the, maybe the mid 90s to the mid thousands. I think like people had kind of worked this out and the balance was, the balance was right. Do you, you kind of feel like, like a lot of the stuff that we're talking about now, it's kind of been in the last 10 years, mm-hmm. that a lot of these ideas have really sprung up and... People, people had kind of gotten over the race thing, and then like people are trying to drag, like you know, it was a big thing in the past, massive yeah. thing in the past, huge problem. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then you kind of reach this level where it was like, oh, you know what? Like most people were kind of, oh, you know what? It's not that big a deal. Like I find myself involved in conversations about race and just the whole idea and the talk m- way more now than I did in 2009. Mm-hmm. You see what I mean? And the world hasn't gotten more racist there's not more oppression there's no there's no group that's being more oppressed now in 2019 than they were in 2009 but 
there's been this heightened, intentional heightened consciousness, right? People are trying to force white people to understand that they have this thing called white privilege and that they should feel guilty about it and that they need to atone for it and they need to self-flagellate and all this kind of thing. There's people pushing that. And then there's people telling, you know, black people that, oh, you know, you are oppressed or you must recognize this and, you know, we must atone for this. And now people are talking about reparations and mm. all these kind of things. And I'm kind of like, man, I thought, I thought, I thought we'd kind of moved past, I thought we'd moved, moved past a lot of these ideas. Why are people so keen to put this back in people's heads. If I am a black man, why, why would anybody want me to think that I'm oppressed? If you're a woman, why, why would, I mean, if I wanted to hold a group down, do you know what I would do? If I wanted to hold women down, do you know what I'd do? If I wanted to hold black people down, do you know what I would do? I would convince them that they're victims and that they're oppressed. Why? Because then it becomes self-serving. Once, you can, once, once they truly believe that, then they will continue to hold themselves down. You don't need to do anything. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very insidious. That's why I oppose some of this stuff so much, right? If you're trying to go out there and convince, no, like you are, like you're, you're, why would someone who wants the best for you want to convince you that you're some kind of... Lesser than. Yeah, that, that you're a victim or that you're, you're somehow, um, yeah, you're, you're somehow lesser than or you're at some disadvantage or something. You know, even if, even if, I don't think it's true, but even if it were true, Okay, even if it were true, like let, 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 me, let, me, let me play into s some people's arguments, okay? Let's say that uh, systemic, institutional, um, and just real life, straight on racism were still very, very rife in the UK or America. Even if that were true, you would still, the best way for individuals to still succeed and flourish would be to encourage them to work hard and educate themselves and do well and make good decisions and push for some of these things which shouldn't necessarily even really be conservative principles, but which now sort of seem to be viewed through that lens. Like, okay, you know, maybe, maybe you're at a little bit of a disadvantage, but if you work hard and you make the right decision, what I like, the world ain't gonna stop you. Like you can, you can, you can get through all that. So I think that now, I don't even think that the society is, I don't believe that society in 2019 is generally structured to hold down anybody, regardless of, of their skin color, their sexuality. Their sex. And I, I see enough evidence day to day that that's just not the case, because you've got millions of successful people who are coming, you know, just succeeding in all ways, shapes, and forms, and most people just don't care. <laughs> like people, people just don't care. The average person, you know, they're not gonna, if they enjoy your podcast or they like the, your business or they, people aren't going to be like, mm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to eat at that restaurant that's owned by a black guy. Nobody does that. Yeah. Nobody thinks like that. And it's like, oh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to buy that, that uh, thing as it was created by a woman. No, but like <laughs> yeah. maybe like 0.001% of people who yeah. are just like totally like weird and just, you know, genuine, genuine bigots mm -hmm. think like that. But it's so rare. It's so rare, but people are still acting like that's how the thing is. Like there's these huge barriers or like there's no barriers. Nobody cares. And people, so people, I think people have that and they use it as an, as an excuse. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's a get out jail free card, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a get out card. It's like, oh, well, you know, I failed, but you know what? It's because society's racist. No, that's good. And you know, I, I'm just a, like, no, I want to, I want to jump into two different things. And yeah. I actually, I actually want to. I want to play devil's advocate for your last yeah, point. Yeah, please do. <laughs> but the first point that you brought up was really good because you talked about most people don't want equality. What they want is revenge. And I don't think most people. Okay. Some people. Some people. Okay, let's clarify. Some people. And that's, and that's really good. And let me tell you why I like that, what you said. The, what I've noticed is that if somebody has hate in their heart, the way they win is by putting hate in your heart. Mm -hmm. That's how they win. Mm -hmm. they, they've won. If they are able to transfer their hate from themselves to you, you're, you are not just like me. You are now the same visceral, angry, miserable, bitter, frustrated, despicable, despicable person as I am mm. because now my hate has gone from me to you. And then you will then pass the hate on to your children and vice versa mm. and so on and so forth. So what I've seen... As everybody knows, is that hurt people hurt people. That's a common phrase that I think is one of the few objective things that most people can agree in in today's world. And obviously, there's always the exception to the rules. But 
That's really true. Mm. And what people don't understand is that hate always has a justification, oh, yeah. whether it's reasonable or not. So whether it's I hate you because you hate me first, or I hate you because you're black. I hate you because you're tall. I hate you because you're rich. I hate you because you're smart. I hate you because you're beautiful. Whatever it is, hate always has justification as unlogical as it may be. Mm. But the, 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 the sin is the hate in the heart. Mm. So what ends up happening is for those in, unfortunately, in communities who have been abused. And I, and I, have, I have real empathy for them because like people have some people have t- terrible experiences in a myriad of communities who are really abused by some people. Mm-hmm. But the worst part is now when that the, the evil of the person who victimized you now becomes the evil that's living in your heart. Mm-hmm. So like you brought it out, a lot of the black. I remember the funny story that that woman who I told you came on my show earlier. When I Google searched her name, she has a really famous tweet that said, on my gravestone, I want it to be known that I hate white people. Wow. And that was like the most, that was the first thing I saw on Twitter. Wow. And it was like, do you understand that like, you've now become this very thing that you're trying to fight against. Mm. And then you see it in what I call third, if not fourth, I mean, in the fourth wave feminism. Mm. Where the misandry is real. Yeah, it is. Where it's now because the the men have wronged me. Now I want to wrong the men. I want to, like you said, I want to get even. Mm. And the first thing that I want to do before we even move a little bit further into it is that let's not we we acknowledge that evil people do evil things to innocent people. Of course. The reality of it is they do it to all kinds of people. Of course. Whether you're Christian, Muslim, Jewish, Buddhist, Hindu, agnostic. Whatever ethnicity, whatever sexual orientation, people are gonna do evil to certain people, mm. and then sometimes, unfortunately, we see it in we see it in slavery. We saw it in Nazi Germany. They group individuals into one group and they abuse yeah, them. I was I was lit- I, what you just said. My last sentence. What's been in my brain as you were just been saying this is a big problem for a lot of people is collectivist thinking. Mm-hmm. Okay, so whether that's collective guilt, collective blame collective responsibility. I don't believe in those things. Yeah. I don't believe in those things, right? It's individual, okay? If, um, if I don't know, I had some bad experience when I was a child and a, a woman was horrible to me or a, uh, a white man was mean to me or whatever, right? That's on that individual. That, I, that, that individual is the person who is responsible for it and who I would blame for that action. Mm-hmm. Lots of people now are taking this and they're using that to paint an entire whole demographic of millions or billions of people who had absolutely nothing yeah. to do with that incident and paint the picture that way, okay? So you'll see this, you know, if you, when you get some of these, you know, using your example, some of these angry feminist type women, okay? Realistically, what has happened with some of them is a man has wronged them at some point in their life. It could have been their father, uh, an ex-boyfriend, their husband. I I don't know, Mm -hmm. okay? And based off of a small handful, a very tiny sample size of personal, very personal anecdotal experiences. Mm -hmm. That's important. They've then used that to say all men. Yeah, behave like this, right? You're, you're taking 3.5 billion people now, yeah. and based off of the actions of three people, yeah. you're demonizing this other three and a half billion. It happens on the other side, too. Of you course. get some angry dudes. Who, when you, you, you see it when people say, whenever someone says, all women, yeah, or, make all men are like this, incels. or all men, yeah. Yeah, all men are like this, or yeah. all women are like, I'm like, no. <laughs> yeah. like, right, no, or all, all white people are like this, all black, I'm like, no. You, you've, you've had an experience with some individuals, yeah. and then, but you can't then use that to, to paint an entire demographic. It's, it's totally ridiculous. I feel the same thing with when you have people who are, say, say you get these kind of like super woke white progressives who are, you know, like just guilty. They're yeah. just like ashamed of being white mm-hmm. and they're, you know, trying to atone for... Mm, and I'm of, like, yeah. you didn't do it, bro. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, yeah. I'm like, you didn't do it. Like, I'm, I will, you will never get me to apologize for something I did not do. Yeah. No. I'm not apologizing for something. If I do something wrong, if I wrong somebody, I'm happy to apologize. Yeah. But you're never going to get me to apologize for 
uh, something, you know, if some, if some evil man somewhere in the world goes out and um, attacks a woman or ra- rapes a woman, okay, he's the one who did it. Yeah. You don't then take that and use it as a cudgel against all men and say, oh, this is what men do. It's like, then, no, that's what that guy, that's yeah. what that one guy did. And you've got a justice system which should punish him accordingly yeah. if he's guilty for it. You don't then just, and it, it's, it's, again, it's one of those things that to me, it's like so obvious. And then it, what also don't. happens is confirmation bias then kicks in. It does. So then what you begin to do is you begin to, one, is confirmation bias and you try to rationalize what happened. Mm-hmm. So what confirmation bias does is like, I wonder, I wonder if anyone else experiences that. Mm. And then when you hear a story in the news, and this is the best way. So it's like, let's say you're a middle-aged white woman living in Ohio, let's say Columbus, Ohio. You don't really interact with a lot of black people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you heard a story or you had an experience, a negative experience with a black person. Like, well, man, these black people are are bad. Then you watch the news. And then what do you see? One black person commits a crime, two black people commit a crime. Mm -hmm. And now these, first you use your, your anecdotal experiences, and then you use the stories in society to now confirm your biases. Exactly. You won't begin to investigate what, what other positive stories is, exist. You just mm. simply want to focus in on the negative. And like you brought up, that's what a lot of these people do. Mm-hmm. They then begin to focus on all these negative things. Because in all honesty, like it's just a really hard conversation to have. Because we, like I love the point that you brought up. We, we, we have this collectivist thinking where we really believe that everybody... Is going back to the point of with, with blackness. Everybody yeah. is this. Everybody is A. Everybody is B. Everybody yeah. is C. Because what somebody once told me is it's, it's a way, I forgot who it was. I think it was um, Sham Booty, where he said it's a way of human beings rationalizing. It's a, I'm sorry, it's a defense mechanism to protect ourselves. Mm-hmm. So, for example, is if you're wandering the, the forest and you see a mushroom and it has spots on it, mm. and then you eat it and then you get sick, then you rationalize, don't eat mushrooms with spots. Yeah, so yeah. all mushrooms with spots are bad. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So basically what we're saying is it may be an evolutionary principle to protect ourselves mm. where we have to generalize things for the well-being of our safety. Yeah. But living in 2019, those old evolutionary ideas that are, that are remnants of our past mm. don't, no longer exist, and they also, and they also cripple us. Mm-hmm. Because now what we then do is that very same exact thing. Man hurts me, all yes. men are bad. Yes. Woman hurts me, all women are bad. Yeah. But like you said, we have to free ourselves from we, that type we, of thinking. We do, and it's it certainly got some, you know, biological wiring in it, mm. and and it makes sense to a degree. Okay, if a woman is walking alone at night in a seedy neighborhood, okay, and there's a group of three women approaching her, versus a group of three men approaching her, she probably should, and you you it would be hard to criticize her for being more wary, more on high alert of the group of three men approaching her, see? So there are levels where it's like, it's reasonable to a degree and everybody does it to a degree, okay? We've all been in situations where, you know, that you, 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 you weigh up the different factors, uh, consciously or unconsciously, and you're like, hmm, is this is there is there a concern here? Is there is there a fear? Should I be concerned? You know, someone, if if you're walking down the street and someone in a someone looking dressed very well, well groomed, wearing a suit approaches you, you probably perceive zero threat. You probably perceive zero potential threat, right? If someone approaches, kind of staggering with a certain look in their eyes and they're dressed a certain way, you will naturally just be slightly more okay maybe you're thinking maybe maybe he'll ask me for money or maybe maybe he's going to say something you, you, you'll, you'll just be prepared so there's there's that level of it, it like you said it's a really hard conversation to have mm-hmm. because it's one of those things where it's like okay i can't totally like absolutely 100 percent condemn all of that thinking or say all oh, none of it makes sense or whatever because there's to a, to a degree mm-hmm. it's understandable but a lot of things go too far. This is always the thing. It's a, lot of, a lot of things can just go too far. This is what happens with a lot of movements, a lot of ideas, a lot of ways of thinking, a lot of ideologies people get stuck in is you kind of take something that's got like a basic element kernel of truth in yeah. it. Like feminism. But yeah, ex- yes. It, that's a great example. Yeah. But then you run, you run so far with that ball mm-hmm. that it's like, wait, hang on. What do, you, what, do you mean, what do you mean all men are? Yeah. What do you mean all men are trash? What do you mm-hmm. mean all men are this? or all? 
I'm like, no, no. Like, are men more aggressive on average than women are? Yes, fact, okay? Um, the reason why, you know, 90% or something of violent criminals, you know, violent, violent pe people prosecuted for violent crimes are, are, are male. Um, but does that mean all men are violent or even most men are violent? No, it doesn't, right? Yeah. So, the, but people don't, people miss that nuance. It's just like, oh, well, look at that, you know, so therefore we can just paint with these really broad brushes. I mean, one thing that I find useful in terms of when people are being silly, like you said of that, that woman, what she said about her gravestone is, oftentimes if I'm trying to determine if something is, you know, really bigoted or unfairly discriminatory in some way, is I simply just switch out words. Okay, so replace black with white or Jewish or Asian, replace man with woman, and see how, see how that sentence sounds. What did you say she wanted on her gravestone? I hate white people. Okay, swap the word white with black. How does that sound? Yeah, <laughs> yeah? yeah. swap the word white with Jewish. How does that sound? Yeah. Like, that sounds like Hitler's gravestone. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if someone, when people say things like that, I'm like, Okay, you know, sometimes, sometimes I'll, I'll do that even with him. I'll be like, wait, just like swap out those words and see how that sounds. Mm. So you, that's a good sign you're, you're saying something that's genuinely mm. like racist or sexist or whatever, right? We want to uphold equal standards. If people want equality, you got to apply equal standards too. You can't say, okay, it's fair. It's okay in that direction. Oh, black people can't be racist. Like that silly, silly phrase, right? Like, so we can, we can, you can say whatever you yeah. want about whatever, but then if it's the other way around, it's like suddenly horrible. I'm like, yeah. no, it's bad it's bad in all directions, mm -hmm. right? And the fact that someone or somebody's ancestors may or may not have done or said something in the past, you can't then just keep holding people guilty of, you know, this is such a simple concept. Like that, that's literally how the legal system is based. You do not hold people guilty for things they did not personally do. Mm -hmm. And so many people want to keep on doing that. And it's like, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I can only trace back my, my family tree so far. Mm -hmm. It's entirely possible that for you or for I, one of our great, 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 great grandfathers could have been some like horrible warlord mm -hmm. or something who was running around raping, pillaging, murdering people. It's possible. In fact, if you go back far enough, it's probably quite likely yeah. right? <laughs> that, that, yeah. that most people's ancestors at some point, you had some terrible, yeah. terrible evil person. But would it make sense to hold you? We're gonna stand you. We're gonna stand you on trial for what your great 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 grandfather did. No, that doesn't that doesn't make sense. It's it's a total. It's incomprehensible. You'd be like, what? That didn't make sense. I didn't do it, man. So just like that, you can't hold someone else guilty for if another man goes out and commits a crime. You can't hold. You, you didn't do it. You shouldn't. You should. You don't need to apologize. You, you get some guy be like, oh, I apologize on behalf of <laughs> man. I'm like, stop. <laughs> you, 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 you yeah, must have yeah. seen that stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, like yeah, stop, yeah, man. Yeah, like yeah, stop yeah. that. Yeah. If you didn't do anything, yeah. you don't need to apologize for anything, right? Yeah. No, that's good, and 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 it really goes back to the problem with anecdotal evidence mm. and the problem with the human experience of understanding human behaviors, because. When people say most men do X, most women do Y, most blacks do A, most Christians do D, whenever, whatever, whatever that word is, how do you know that? Like, really? Like, how do you know? Unless it's something like objective. You yeah, know, yeah, like yeah. Most yeah. Christians believe in Jesus. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, but yeah. like, how do you know these things? Yeah. And a lot of times, like you said, it goes back to your experiences. But the number one problem that most people don't ever realize is that what if, to your point you talked about earlier, what if your experiences are wrong? Mm -hmm. What if you have a very slanted view of life? Mm -hmm. And the best way to do it is to use men as an example because the women will get mad. <laughs> we use them as an example. But let's say you're a guy, and like you said, you were abused by a female babysitter. Mm -hmm. And then you were molested by one of your mother's friends. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you had a very um, shady teacher who would do bad things and intentionally lose your gr papers and give yeah. you bad remarks. Is it then, from your personal experiences, women have done a lot of evil to you. Mm -hmm. Is it then fair now to create a whole worldview that all women are evil? Of course not. And most women will say, well, I'm sorry you had bad experiences with some, mm -hmm. but we are all not like that. Exactly. Let's take that. <laughs> 
and let's use that across all different people. Because most people have not been around Muslims. Mm-hmm. Uh, you were in Saudi Arabia. You were around the Muslims. Yeah. And I love what you were sharing with Ben about, well, actually, they're not as bad as people say they are. No, no. You know, And most people... And all honestly, especially in the black community, have not been around a lot of white Americans mm. or white individuals. So you, you don't know. That's interesting. That's, yeah. that's quite unique to, um, you know, uh, in the UK, that's a lot sort of rarer. Yeah. It's harder to, you know, there, there are more parts in the US and obviously in Africa where you could be a black person and actually not interact with Mm -hmm. a lot of white people besides me you know maybe some like really inner city areas of some of the big cities of the uk that's almost impossible yeah you you, you know what i mean so it's uh that's just just a just a little point to bring up (laughs) yeah no and so i think the beauty of life is when you're when one you're able to really understand the diversity of the human experience Mm -hmm. And when you understand the diversity of the human experience, what you find out is most humans are not malicious. No. By no means. No. Most humans do wrong, but mm-hmm. we, all, we all do wrong. And there's a, a myriad of reasons to why we do wrong to other mm-hmm. people. And what you then find out is that there's no group of people who are all of them trying to do evil to all groups of people. Right? It's just, it's just there's usually a leader... Mm-hmm. Who has prominence, mm-hmm. who will then take advantage of the impressionable few, who now this small minority, which you brought up, now will wreak havoc on the vast majority. Yeah. Or the small minority will speak on behalf of the vast majority, because like you brought up, the vast majority is silent, mm-hmm. because a squeaky wheel gets the oil. That's what people don't understand. It's like, when people are like, all men cheat, or all men do this to women. I'm like, do you understand that the woman who's been raped, unfortunately, who's been abused by her husband, is going to be crying louder and more vocal than the woman who's happy at home with her husband and her children having a great time. Mm -hmm. The woman who's happy at home having a great time doesn't have... She's not typing on the internet. She doesn't have Twitter. I'm sorry. (laughs) You know? She's not having a blog that's popular because, in the reality, negativity sells. It does. Negativity is way more prominent, and it and it's when it's way vaster in the in the social um, ethos than positivity. Even to the fact that there was this one news station in Minnesota, because I was a broadcast journalism major, so we we had to research this story. A news station in Minnesota, which said the news is so negative that we want to create a news station that's only that's mainly positive. Oh well. Wow. So they said, let's create a new station that's mainly positive, only positive news, only what's encouraging, only what's good for the most part. Mm -hmm. Within a year, station shut down. Wow. Lowest ratings of any new station of all time. Crazy. Because people didn't want to hear that crap. Mm. Where's the murder? Where's the rape? Where's the theft? Where's a politician having a sex scandal? Where's the war with this international superpower? We want to hear the bad stuff. Mm. So what you then realize is that for a lot of people because of the human and and, and it's biological your mind in a primitive world has to know what's bad i need to know where the lion is Mm -hmm. i need to know where the food's going to be i need to know when the drought season's coming your mind has to know what's bad for the protection of yourself today but in today's world like you said now it has negative consequences Mm -hmm. and so many people now don't understand the fullness of any group of people, but they simply believe the negative stories of a few. And the best way to understand it, which most Americans can see it, was what happened in 9-11. Before 9-11, nobody thought anything of Muslims. That's true. Nobody really thought of anything. No one just really thought of anything about Muslims, Mm -hmm. for the most part. No one really cared. The moment those few people committed that crime to um, the World Trade Center and the Pentagon... Now, the whole country, for the most part, sentiments towards Muslims change. Mm. I'll never forget it. I was in school. I know I'm rambling. <laughs> but no, I was in I school. Remember. I was in sixth grade. And that's, at that time, I was Muslim <laughs> because I said I want to be Muslim like my dad. And I was in sixth, in sixth grade. And I remember there was kids. I was at a black school. Mm. And they were like, yo, where the Muslims at? And there were kids looking to beat up Muslims wow. that day. 
I remember that. So I was like, I ain't Muslim. <laughs> I wasn't wow, Muslim today. That's nuts. But, but they were looking that's to nuts. be the Muslim. Now, obviously, it's my own anecdotal story, so I won't say that yeah, was going yeah, around yeah, across yeah. the country. But you saw the sentiments towards Muslims change. Sure. And so I really, really want to challenge individuals, which I, which I love that you're doing. Yo, let's get out of this group think. And let's get out of demonizing the all mm. because of the behaviors of the few. Yeah. Man, you, you nailed it. <laughs> you know, literally, literally, literally you, yeah. you nailed it. I'm like, man, I have nothing to, I have, I have nothing to add to that. It's, it's that. It's that. I mean, you know, it's, it's entirely possible to understand from a sort of psychological basis mm -hmm. why certain things exist or why people think in certain ways, right? Like... With, with a high degree of empathy, I can understand those, you know, young men out there who, you know, were, were saying that at your school. Like, I can, from a, from a psychological basis, just knowing how human beings are and, you know, tribal mentalities and things like that, I can understand why people hold those views. I can understand why people hold a lot of different views, but it's still wrong. You see, you see what I mean? So it's like I get... I get why you feel like that. This is this is where you where you move from the feelings to the facts, okay? Because the feeling is might be a visceral reaction. Like I want to lash out at the closest thing that resembles the thing that hurt me or somebody or something I care about. Okay? Someone might if someone's child gets bitten by a dog, I can understand with a high degree of empathy. I can understand why a, a guy might just want to go out and kick a dog, mm -hmm. just a random dog, okay? Factually, logically, rationally, morally, wrong, stupid, dumb. But you can, you can kind of get where, it's, where it stems from. So that's why it's important to kind of move out of that realm of everything being run by feelings and emotions to, you know, logic, logic and reason where possible. You know, sometimes sometimes emotions are important and emotions matter and you want to be able to sympathize with people who are going through problems or who have had issues or who have faced abuse or some kind of trauma or any kind of negative experience, right? You don't want to remove emotionality from human beings. But there are times where emotionality and emotional thinking is both wrong and potentially dangerous. So those are the times where it's important to have, you know, just cool, level-headed people around, I guess, to just be like, wait, no, hang on, man, hang on, like, think, think about this, right? Think about this, okay? Those, those eleven guys who did, who brought down, was it eleven guys who brought down the towers? Something I like that. I don't remember. I think it was 11, <laughs> something like that. But that was eleven. That was those people, okay? You have over a billion Muslim people in the world. Vast majority who would totally condemn that, and all of them besides those people and maybe anyone they coordinated with who had absolutely nothing to do with that. And when you think of it logically and you go through the logical steps, you'll be like, okay, it makes no sense to go out to in school and find Muslim kids and want to attack. Like, it makes, makes no sense. There's no logical, right? The, the logical sequence does not lead to that conclusion. But the emotional one can jump straight to it. So with, with a lot of this stuff, with a lot of these things we're talking about, it's dealing with emotional people and trying to take them out of that emotional state and just be like, okay, wait, like, let's just, let's just think about this rationally, okay? You've been through this. You've had negative experiences with men or with women or with, with whatever demographic of people, but let, let's, let's think about this logically. Let's move away from the anecdotal and the emotional, and let's just think logically. Um, so I, I don't know the... I don't know the perfect way to uh, <laughs> to yeah. do this because you're dealing with human beings, man. Human beings have been complicated and irrational from from the beginning, mm -hmm. as as far as I'm aware. Yeah. So uh, you know, you got to remember, you know, you're a Christian. You know, like people kill Jesus, right? So you know, like you're right. That 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 wasn't a logical. Yeah. You know, that that wasn't a logical decision, right? People held him guilty for he represented something that they felt that they hate, mm -hmm. right? That's why I like certain biblical stories a lot because it's still they're still so relevant in terms of the way people behave of course, and the way people think or don't think. And the fact that, you know, the, the idea of, of justice can get very skewed and messed up, especially when emotionality and things like that come into play. It's like, okay, you want to release the actual murderer, but mm -hmm. you want to kill the guy who hasn't 
harmed anybody yeah. because what he represents mm. is somehow in your brain that you've seen the same thing with um i mean you, you, you see it a lot now i mean it's weird i i said um the quickest way to get demonized in this sort of modern era is to suggest to people that you know one is to promote personal responsibility you will get demonized it doesn't matter if you're talking health fitness finances anything if you if careers if you tell people to take personal responsibility for their lives you will get you will get attacked and i've i've noticed this i've noticed this pattern um so but like i said that's why i, I love guys like you know I, i'm a huge fan of you know you said you're a fan of jordan peterson I'm, I'm a huge fan i've got a lyric where i mentioned him in fact called myself the jordan peterson a rap in one of my songs which mm. a lot of people like that bar yeah. um but if you see the way if you're someone who's followed him and has read his book and listened to what he says and you juxtap you juxtaposition that to some of the media hit pieces about him or what is written yeah. about i'm like what on earth yeah, like yeah, it, yeah. it's so different mm -hmm. that it's just amazing and i've seen lots of different people maligned and misrepresented in these various ways and it's just like man so when it when it gets all crazy to me i'm like you know what yeah like you know but people demonized and killed jesus so, yeah. so if if that can happen and considering human beings haven't really changed all that much in 2000 years we've got better technology but we're not really any not really different <laughs> you know yeah, no. and it and it doesn't take a lot to bring out some of that tribal irrational thought so it's important that we are i think it's important that we are aware that we all have that within us mm. and that way that way you can kind of keep it that way you can keep it in check mm. right i think a lot of people haven't sort of done the self reflection or the understanding of history or psychology just to understand you know what human beings are capable all of us are capable of falling into some really dark places and then once you acknowledge that then it's like okay i'm aware that somewhere in me even if i don't feel it right now even if i don't think i'm that guy somewhere in me mm -hmm. is that ability to do it so let me make sure i act and behave and i speak in a way that keeps me sort of out of that one last thing one thing that's really interesting is um you know whenever especially if you're talking about stuff historically any kind of historical oppression or crime or absolute catastrophe people always imagine that they would be they would be the good guy or the victim always okay if people think back to nazi germany soviet russia any kind of genocide any kind of evil people always assume that they would have been the good guy they would have been the one to end slavery mm -hmm. right if they existed in america 300 years ago like they would have been the one to end it mm -hmm. most people wouldn't this is this is this is just it's it's a horrible reality but it's like most people wouldn't most people will go with the status quo what people most people will go with the majority opinion or the sentiment at the time and it's important to recognize that because then you know look even if the majority sentiment is a certain way at a certain time one that doesn't necessarily mean that it's correct and two by going along with it at certain times if stuff is you know super duper elevated like it can lead to you know really 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 bad places because you know history history what they say history doesn't repeat itself but it rhymes mm -hmm. okay and sometimes yeah you know you you can see little little tidbits of things going on where you're like man like that's crazy but that's just human nature is human nature yeah and it's uh it's a beautiful thing but it can also be a uh it's like the best thing in the world and the worst thing in the world simultaneously, you know? No, that's, that's really good. And I, I really enjoy that, that closing point because what I really enjoy about the Christian message is that you don't begin by viewing yourself as a victim. You actually begin by viewing yourself as a villain. Mm. You don't begin by saying, I'm Jesus. You actually begin by saying, I was Pontius Pilate. You begin by saying, no, I was the one who put him there. Mm. You know? Yeah, yeah. So you start out recognizing the flaw in your humanity. 
you start off recognizing the sinful nature that you can possess. And you start off recognizing that though I'm not as quote unquote evil Mm -hmm. as the next guy, Mm -hmm. that same evil exists in me. And it's through that you then begin to have empathy for other people. And it's through that where you begin the journey of taking that responsibility for yourself Mm -hmm. and to grow into the person that God created you to be. And we don't have to go through the history of slavery. We don't have to go through the history of women being oppressed in the world and not having the rights to vote and being abused and domestic violence. We don't have to go through the history of those in, you know, the gay community. We, we don't have to go through the history because if you're listening to this podcast, hopefully you have a semi-decent education and you know it. Yeah. But what we're advocating for is moving forward. Mm-hmm. And what we're advocating for is how to create a better tomorrow. And I'm really, really, really thankful for what you're doing because your ideas, your message, your teachings – your worldview is helping people create a better future for themselves, um, for their families, and also for their communities. So thank you so much, Zuby, man. I really appreciate you coming on the show. I'm and, humbled, man. Thank you so and, much. And uh, blessing the audience with your wisdom. Where can they reach you at? Sure. So I'm on everything at Zuby Music on all social media. You can find me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, all of them the same, Z-U-B-Y Music. My main website is ZubyMusic.com. If you want to check out my book or my merchandise, you can also find me at teamzuby.com. And uh, my podcast is available on, and podcast and music, available on all the usual channels, YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, whatever you use. Awesome. So guys, you know how we get down. Make sure you reach out to Zuby. Let him know what about this podcast stood out to you guys. Make sure you show him some support. My name is Hafiz, and I'm joined by Zuby. And we got a roommates, guys. Thank you so much for your support, and have a great day. Awesome, man. That was dope. Right there.